WD check. As you can see, my portfolio is not an easy one. But I do enjoy the many cuts inflicted on me and, and, the, many, and the many speeches. Yeah, I'm not masochistic, but uh, it's an important ministry because millions of people's <coughs> lives are affected uh, where you stay. And if I can make a little contribution to make their lives better, a few more cuts, I don't mind. This is my second uh, MNDCOS, although I've been here almost two years now. And I think we have achieve a few things. So to the many cuts, I have some answers, but to many of your questions, <clears throat> I do not have them yet. But at least I'd like to share with you how I think we can go forward on this. Deputy Chair, we had an intense debate in Parliament just last month. Let me share just my two takeaways. First, Singaporeans continue to be unhappy with the current infrastructure crunch, including the housing imbalance. We are addressing this aggressively. Second, Singaporeans care deeply about Singapore and its future. They want to help build a vibrant and inclusive Singapore for future generations to come. And we will facilitate such participation. In the area of housing, I will involve fellow Singaporeans in working out some housing policies together. Let me elaborate on these two takeaways. First, the current housing imbalance. It's temporary and given sufficient time can be solved. This I'm confident. As I said, I've been in MND for almost two years, so I thought I'll use this occasion to report to you on the progress of these two years. First, we increased supply dramatically an exceptionally large number of new homes are currently being built. We'll begin to feel the impact this year when 30,000, 30,000 units are completed and families get the keys to their new homes. But the full impact will kick in from next year when 50,000 units are completed, followed by 54,000 units in 2015 and 63,000 units in 2016. For public housing specifically, the ramped up program has statistically cleared our backlog of married HDB first-timers. With 15,000 marriages each year, family formation is well within this building program of 25,000 per year. But some of them have lost out during balloting to couples yet to marry under the fiancé scheme, who outnumber them in BTO applications. So we are correcting this through this Parenthood Priority Scheme, PPS. In the recent exercise for non-mature estates, most of the 600 married HDB first-timers with children who apply will get a chance to select one. Mr. Sia Kemping proposed that we should now extend PPS to pregnant mothers. I agree. And we can do so from the May BTO launch. By the way, Mr. Sia was the first who suggested giving housing priority to young couples with children. This was some three years ago. I would like to record his role as the father of PPS. <laughs> I'm just a midwife. After we have cleared this backlog, we will extend the scheme to cover those already married but without children yet, and I hope to be able to do so <coughs> next year. Mr. Jaragiam asked whether when we do this extension, will the quota be, shifted, will the quota be, be amended? Yeah, certainly. Otherwise, uh, you, know, you won't be able to, to clear the backlog of the targeted population. You see, just to share with you, the, if you look at the profile of the BTO applicants, it's quite interesting. First timers, first timer applicants, I rely on memory, I think about 55% are not yet married. So these are fiancé, fiancé scheme. So more than half 
That's what I, I meant when I said they outnumbered the already married couples. Then I think those with children formed about 20%, and those married, not yet with children, the remaining whatever, 20, 25%. Yeah. So we, will have, we can easily adjust the quota in order to achieve the purpose of clearing the backlog. But to me, this is the clear ranking priority, which I think is fair. Those who are already married with children, I think, try to give them as fast as, as we can. Those married, not yet children, give it to them, and then they have to deliver the deal, which is the babies next year. And then those who are not yet married, get them to get the flat, get the keys, and quickly get married and have babies. We have complemented the PPS with a parenthood provisional housing scheme. This provides an additional housing option to first-timer married couples with a child who need to rent while they await completion of their new HDB flats. And the father of this scheme is Minister Lim Hung Kiang. He proposed this to me a couple of years ago, and, and I, I always remember that. And when I had a chance to do so, so now the baby is delivered. The scheme has attracted 200 plus applicants. All the 200 plus families can soon move into the these interim flats after they have been retrofitted. Mr. Yeo Gua Kwan suggested that we extend the scheme to married HDB first-timers without children. As we still have a few hundred vacant units, I'm able to say yes to Mr. Yeo. In other words, all married HDB first-timers with or without children will be eligible for such interim rental flats while they wait for the new flats to be completed. And of course, in the process, if uh, demand were to exceed supply, we, will still, we must still give priority to those with children. Second, we stabilize BTO prices by delinking them from the resale market. This is done by increasing subsidy and keeping BTO prices steady, even as resale prices go up. We are committed to continuing it until the market stabilizes. Mr. Nyam asked, you know, what do I mean by stability? And we will assess it by examining, for example, the resale price index. He also asked about how we compute market discount. This is not difficult to calculate because the resale prices of most flat types are widely available. In fact, we publish them on HDB uh, website. But of course, it's not so easy comparing two flat units because local characteristics have to be factor in. So there's some subjective element. Is it near to MRT? Is it not? Which level? Is it level 15 or level 40? Etc. Etc. I think those are the, the adjustments that we need, one need to make. In the last two years, 38,000 HDB first-timer families have benefited from this new pricing policy. The attractiveness of the new BTO prices has been noted, noticed Almost all HDB first-timers now buy their new flats instead of resale flats. This is quite a big change. In the past, it used more bought direct from resale flat because it's immediately available. Now, almost all got it from us. This has diverted significant demand from the resale market and has helped to moderate the rise in resale prices. But we know that this is not enough to tame the resale market because resale flat prices, like that of private properties, are determined by the market and they are heavily influenced by market sentiments. And this is where the media does play a role to guide the sentiments. Mr. Ang Wei Nen mentioned a CA, CNA uh, report last night about some $900,000 resale flat unit. Yeah, I was watching the news and I, and I noted it too. So this morning when I look, flip through uh, uh, Straits Times, Straits Times reported on the same story, but correctly pointed out, highlighted the main issue of the story, which is that resale transactions has plunged, which is actually the main story. 
Unfortunately, CNA chose to forget about the, the main part of the story, but focus on this $900,000 unit, which obviously is an outlier, and is in a resale market. It's beyond my control. So I hope media can help us here. I think we, we are in a collective exercise here. I think nobody wants the property market to continue to escalate and building up a possible bubble. I think that nobody will benefit. So I think all of us are in, in this boat together. We also want to bring, calm down the property market. The way Straits Times reported on this same story had a calming effect. The way CNA do so, unfortunately, had an alarming effect and should not be repeated. Third, we acted to curb speculative demand in our property market. Sub-sales as a proportion of all private housing sale transactions have fallen to 7%. We have gone on to curb investment demand, especially with the recent cooling package. It's still early days, but we observe that some developers have lowered their prices. Most analysts expect the measures to impact both sale volumes and prices. These cooling measures are necessary as we don't want Singaporeans to overstretch and expose themselves to unforeseen changes in the property market. I think yesterday, uh, NMP uh, Tan Su Shan gave a good speech when she talked about her worry of this uh, double whammy in the property market. And she worried that if there was this perfect storm or double whammy and the global economic slowdown and interest rates go up, then what will happen to those who go in now hoping to buy their second or third property as investments and hoping to make a killing? They may get killed in the process because we are vulnerable to external shocks such as a global economic downturn or a rise in interest rates. Interest rates now are extraordinarily low, both globally and in Singapore. They could return to the norm very quickly. An increase of two to three percentage points, which is conceivable, could increase mortgage payments by up to 40% for zero. If homeowners fall behind on their mortgage payments, they could lose their homes. And this had happened to many Singaporeans not too long ago. We will do all we can to prevent a property bubble because no one benefits and many will get hurt when a property bubble bursts. We continue to watch over the property market and we will harden the cooling measures if necessary. Lastly, we increase access to public housing. We raised the BTO and executive condominium income ceilings in 2011. So eight in 10 households now have access to new affordable flats directly from HDB. As we reduced the first timer backlog, we tripled the second timer quota for BTO flats in non-merger estates last year. We share engineer Dr. Lee Bihua and Mr. Hari Kumar's concerns on ECs and in January, we tightened the EC housing scheme to notch it back to its original policy intent. And I'm ever ready to tighten the scheme further if necessary. So this is briefly the progress in two years. I think the immediate phase of firefighting for first-timers is over, but there are still some hot spots to tackle. The temperature has come down a few notches, but it's still uncomfortable, I know. The progress has, however, gained us some breathing space to take a pause and review the priorities for the next two years. And in addition, I'm taking the opportunity of this COS to begin the process of a public discussion on our longer-term housing policies. Let me first discuss the housing work plan for this financial year my third year in MND. This year, we will maintain the ramp-up construction program and launch another 25,000 BTO flats. 
couple of months ago, HDB announced that they, would, they were planning about 23,000 BTO flats. I decided to tell, to tell them to up the figure, 25,000, because I wanted to decisively clear the backlog of all married HDB first-timers this year. This will allow us to begin to meet the housing needs of other segments of the population besides the first-timers. First, singles. While families will continue to be our top priority, singles have housing needs too. This we know. Currently, singles aged 35 and above can buy resale flats. And each year, about 4,000 do. However, rising resale prices have made it difficult for them. Engineer Li Bihua, Mr. Lim Biao Chuan spoke about their difficulties and asked that we allow singles to buy new HDB flats directly from HDB. And we will do so. Yeah. We will allow first-timer singles aged 35 and above to buy new two-room flats directly from HDB to meet their housing needs. These will be singles, singles earning up to $5,000 per month as they face more financial difficulty owning a home. These new flats will be built in non-mature estates in order to keep the prices down. They will come in two sizes, 35 square meter and 45 square meter, and we leave it to them to choose according to their needs and budget. A couple of other important details are still being finalized. For example, how much should we subsidize the flats as compared to married couples? What should the relative priority be between singles and married couples applying for these flats? We will settle these outstanding issues as quickly as we can so that the first batch of eligible singles can apply in the July BTO launch, most likely in Sengkang. I don't know who is the MP there. Second, second timers. You with lumping in it. Second timers. This is a diverse group, and most of them already have a home. But they are looking for a change, either upwards, downwards, or laterally. Their needs vary, and typically they buy from the resale market as it should. But many have sought to get it directly from HDB. In the last two years, because of our attractive BTO prices, second timer applicants have doubled to 30,000 last year. To help more second timers, we tripled the second timer quota in non mature estates from 5% to 15% in March last year. This has reduced second timer application rates in non mature estates significantly to about 10. Some have difficulties paying the resale levy, as uh, commented by engineer Li Bi Hua, I think Muhammad Faisal. We try to help, for example, by including the resale levy in the price for the flat so that it can be paid for as part of the housing loan. This has to be on a case-by-case -case basis, so do appeal if you feel uh, that there are genuine cases of difficulties and we will, as always, try to be as compassionate as we can. This year, we will take further steps to help two vulnerable groups of second-timers. We will double the second-timer quota for two-room and three-room flats in non-mature estates from 15% to 30%. This will help second-timers needing to downgrade. I give priority to those who are looking at smaller units, obviously with a view to downgrade presumably with financial difficulties. This will help, this will help them downgrade and uh, address some of their financial difficulties. In addition, I think in line with Mr. Edwin Tong's uh, feedback, we will reserve 5 percentage point of this 30%, so 5% of this quota for divorcees or widowed who have children below 16. This will almost guarantee their ability to select a two-room flat and significantly increase the chances of those who apply for a three-room flat. These changes will be implemented from the May BTO launch. We will further help those divorcees who face debarment 
from uh, subsidized flats by shortening the demandment period from five years to three years. I think this will help them move on with their lives, especially those with children. As a further measure of assistance, Dr. Teo Ho Pin suggested selling balanced flats on a daily basis as and when they become available. This one, I have some problem. Because we have been actively clearing our stock of balanced flats through the various sale of balanced flats exercise, SBF. Currently, there is only a small outstanding stock of about 5,000 flats at various stages of construction. We will put those nearing com completion, and there are about 3,000 such units, to market pretty soon. There are significant benefits in bunching them for sale under SBF. Small batches inevitably attract disproportionately large numbers of applicants, resulting in repeated disappointment and intense frustration. I hope Dr. Teo can accept this explanation. His suggestion of putting, giving them on a first-come, first-served basis doesn't quite work because you put them on, on a first-come, first-served, it, it may not reflect the, the order of priority. And more, moreover, if it is first come, first serve, and, and if, when it is your turn to select, and if it is a unit which you do not like, then you reject, then you go back to, a, to the back of a very long queue, I think there will be more unhappiness. Third, seniors and retirees. I agree with uh, Ms. Fumiha that many of our seniors have significant assets in their houses. This opens up opportunities for them to get some retirement income, for example, by subletting their flats or their rooms. This year, we have increased their options by implementing the new Silver Housing Bonus Scheme to facilitate right-sizing and the Enhanced Lease Buyback Scheme to support ageing in place. But many may still not be aware of the schemes or they may not have accurate information. So we will step up public outreach and financial counselling to those who may benefit from these options. To support right-sizing, we are building more studio apartments for seniors and in various towns. Because I know many are prepared to right-size, provided they don't have to leave the neighbourhood. So we are introducing a new scheme, a new studio apartment priority scheme, SAPS and we will reserve half of the supply for seniors who apply for one either near their current flat in their same community or near where their children live. This is a further enhancement to the current Aging in Place Priority Scheme or the Married Child Priority Scheme which award priority through giving the seniors more ballot chances. The new Studio Apartment Priority Scheme will replace these two priority schemes this will be implemented from the May BTO exercise. But I agree with uh, Dr. Teo Ho Pin and Mr. Gan Thiam po that many multi-generational families prefer to live together or close to one another. And that's why last year we introduced the multi-generation priority scheme to allow them to apply in the same BTO project so that they can live close by. More than 60 pairs of families have benefited from it. Not that many, but for the 60 families, you know, they were most uh, happy. Engineer Li Bihua suggested that we go further and build some multi-generational flats, presumably, say, with four bedrooms, to help such families live in the same flat. I heard her. I, I, I heard she advanced very strong arguments on how such families could better support, especially the newlyweds, both financially as well as transmitting important cultural values. I agree with her. I, I believe there is some demand because some of my residents come to me too for such a multi-generational flats. But I, I really don't know how big the demand is. Anyway, I've asked HDB to consider doing so in some BTO developments to test out their demand. If we can, we'll try to do one in uh, Yisun. On a separate point, Ms. Fumiha spoke about the growth of foreigner enclaves in some HDB blocks. I agree with her that we should avoid such enclaves. Ms. Fu suggested that we kept the number at 
say, 10% of each block. Let us do some analysis to see if 10% is the appropriate cap. I find it a bit low. I, I, I think it sounds, I think it's on the low side. But anyway, let us do the analysis. But in principle, I agree that we should impose one. And while we sort out the implementation details, HDB will immediately cap approvals for all new and renewal of HDB tenancy agreements involving non-citizens to one and a half years. Right now it's three years, we, will, we shall halve it immediately. These changes will now apply to Malaysian tenants as they face less integration challenges. Deputy Chair, for the rest of this speech, let me elaborate on my second takeaway of involving Singaporeans more in designing housing policies. After 50 years of public housing, I think it's good to re-examine some old assumptions and revisit <coughs> some key policies. And I intend to do so jointly with Singaporeans. For certain, the next 50 years will be very different from the last 50. First, home ownership has already crossed 90%. I think we have probably reached the limit of what is possible. Second, the days of high economic growth, 7%, 8%, 9%, and hence strong wage growth are over. As property prices are closely correlated with economic growth, low growth means huge capital gains that our parents and our generation made through reselling HDB flats will now become less likely. Third, Singapore's population was young and rapidly growing in the past, but future growth will severely moderate. Increasing singlehood and declining birth rates may persist though we will continue to persevere to reverse those trends. This has implications on family formation and household size. Fourth, the biological aging of the population and the physical aging of HDB towns will become the dominant themes that shape and color our community life. HDB estate layout and designs will need to keep pace with such major social developments. In short, our public housing system needs to evolve with the times. Which elements in our current system remain relevant? Which require enhancement or strengthening? Which need to be overhauled? If some major changes are called for, how do we implement them without adversely affecting the vast majority of Singaporeans who own those valuable assets and are quite comfortable with a status quo, especially the elderly, you know, because Ms. Lee Bihar's point about how to further monetize their assets, I think they will be most worried if the assets suddenly shrink because we bring about some policies to bring the prices down. These are complex issues affecting millions of Singaporeans. So while change is necessary to address these challenges, it's important that in so doing, we don't forget the needs of the silent majority. We should give voice to those in our society who are less well resourced to make their interests, their needs and their concerns heard. Policies must benefit the larger good. As we make changes, we must be mindful not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We must implement these changes judiciously and with heart. Engineer Lee Bi Hua, Mr. Muhammad Faisal, Mr. Liang Ying Hua, Mr. Pritam Singh, Mr. Hari Kuma, Mr. Yo Gua Kwan, all have made thoughtful comments on this very important subject of housing policies going forward. I listened carefully and I thank you all. From their speeches and other comments at during the, our Singapore conversations, I distilled four issues worthy of deeper reflection. First, at the ideological level, what should be the purpose for building HDB flats? Second, at the practical level, what kind of housing should the government provide to meet future needs? 
Third, at the individual level, how do we address affordability concerns of HDB flat buyers living in a global city with a high-end private property segment imposing upward pressure on mass market private homes and HDB resale prices? Fourth, at the macroeconomic level, how should public housing respond to upcoming demographic changes and specifically how can we help elderly Singaporeans better monetize their housing assets? Let me elaborate. First, what should be the purpose of building HDB flats? The HDB flat is first and foremost a home where couples start their lives together and build their hopes and dreams. This is fundamental. But it is also an asset which they can use to build a better life in their prime and provide security for their retirement needs. In the early years of Singapore's independence, homelessness and squatter living were the norm. So at that time, we were all HDB first-timers, having basic, no-frills, low-cost homes top priority. But as Singapore progressed from third world to the first, the quality of HDB flats have improved dramatically and we have now become a nation of proud homeowners. The majority are HDB second-timers. HDB flats have become significant assets to most Singaporeans. A home is now also an asset. This is a proud achievement which citizens in many other countries could only hope or dream about. We enable this transformation through several important housing policy changes over the decades. I thought it useful to recount the key milestones. In 1971, we allowed HDB flats to be resold for a profit. Before that, flats could only be sold back to HDB at very low predetermined prices. In 1989, we allowed flat owners to retain their HDB flats even when they buy a private property. Before that, they would have to sell off their HDB flats. In 1993, we allowed buyers to take loans based on the prevailing market value of the flat, which allowed sellers to maximize the value of their assets. Before that, housing loans were based on HDB's historical selling price. In 2003, we allowed flat owners to sublet their flats. Before that, the underlying principle was strict owner occupation. These policy changes have benefited many Singaporeans. Many were able to upgrade their homes and dramatically improve their quality of life. It has also allowed many to accumulate large nest eggs to fund their retirement needs. Looking ahead, as we may no longer get the same kind of returns from reselling a HDB flat as in the past, how will its role as an asset be affected? If it is likely to diminish, how should we make the adjustments? How will any such adjustments impact different groups of Singaporeans? with different aspirations and needs. Second, what kind of housing should the government provide to support future needs? And at what size? I heard Mr. Pritam Singh talking about this particular aspect just now. I don't have an immediate answer. I think we have to search for the answers together. Over the years, we have widened the range of choices in terms of flat types and designs to meet a wide range of aspirations. Many are clamoring for HDB to return to basics and its original mission of helping Singaporeans own a basic home. But what does returning to basics mean? Does returning to basics mean that we should focus only on HDB flats? then where should we set the income ceiling for HDB flats? Should we lower it, raise it, or lift it altogether? What about the upper middle class? Should we, for example, stop offering ECs, as suggested by Mr. Harikuma, 
and engineer Li Bihua. Does returning to basics mean that we return to pre-2003 days of strict owner occupation? How will this affect the many retirees who now rely on income from subletting or the younger, home, younger homeowners who use it to help support their lifestyle? Does returning to basics mean that we return to pre-1989 days when we require HDB flat owners to sell off their flats when they buy a private residential property, as suggested by Mr. Harikuma? How will this affect the plans of many Singaporeans who aspire to live in a private condo and use their HDB flat for additional rental income? Third, how do we ensure the affordability of new HDB flats for a new generation of newlyweds? Global liquidity and low interest rates since the global financial crisis of 2009 have caused house prices to appreciate sharply more than income growth. Affordability has worsened. While high prices make homeowners happy, it has caused anxiety amongst young buyers as well as their parents. Some can look to their parents for help, but this may be at the expense of the parents' retirement savings. We will do more to reduce BTO flat prices relative to income and reduce the financial burden of housing on our young. One way is to increase housing grants for families with children to partly improve affordability and partly to reward parenthood, as suggested by Mr. Gan Tian Po. Mr. Ang Wing Neng suggested the same thing, you know, but uh, not looking at it from the parenthood incentivization point of view. But there may be other ways. However, even as we make new HDB flats cheaper, we must continue to encourage prudence and avoid overspending on housing. I think a point very well emphasized by Ms. Penny Lo. So I agree with her and Mr. Yo Gua Kwang that more must be done to help Singaporeans buy within their means. Higher housing grants must, however, not lead to more people buying larger flat types than they can afford. I hope this is a principle that we can have consensus upon. In the earlier days, a three-room flat was acceptable to many. Now, I think it is four-room flat, and some five-room flat, and some maybe an EC. What can a young graduate couple in the workforce for two years reasonably aspire to? What about a lower-income household? Are these aspirations within their means? Will they get into trouble if individual circumstances change suddenly or when the economy heads south? As a government, how can we help meet newlyweds' aspirations while also ensuring that they make prudent and sustainable purchases? Fourth, how should public housing respond to the aging of our population? When our population was young, and incomes were rising across the board, public housing was an effective way of sharing the fruits of economic growth. But as our population ages and economic growth moderates, I agree with Ms. Fu, we have to be much more proactive and creative in working out options to help our seniors unlock their assets in the HDB flats. We have tinkered with the lease buyback scheme, introduced some right-sizing <coughs> incentives what else can we do? Sir, our public housing policies have been highly successful in enabling the vast majority of Singaporeans to own their homes. The opportunity to own homes has not been confined to those in the higher or middle income groups. Low income Singaporeans too have benefited. This is quite unique in the world. And our achievement has been the envy and the subject of many studies by many countries. I know because I receive these visitors almost every week, every other week. A relook is, however, necessary in the light of significant demographic and economic changes. The primary mission of HDB to offer an affordable flat for the majority of Singaporeans will remain unchanged. 
Fortunately, this is within our control. As we set BTO prices, and HDB is the largest housing developer. We have stopped BTO prices from rising by delinking them from resale prices. So we can now pause and see what else we can do to bring BTO prices in non-mature estates to say around four years of salary as it was before the current property cycle started. We will do so partly through cooling measures to nudge the property market down and partly by seeing if an alternative housing option can be designed. One thing is clear. We are committed to restoring and maintaining the affordability of new HDB flats to the vast majority of first-timer Singaporean households. They are Singapore dream of owning their own homes just like their parents is safe. We will make sure of that. At the same time, with the aging population and the bulk of seniors' savings tied up in their HDB flats, we will press on with more options for the seniors to unlock their assets. I've earlier posed quite a number of questions which we need to find answers to. They are not trivial questions. And forging consensus on what the answers should be will be challenging. But they are useful food for thought, I, I thought. Post-COS, I agree with Professor Faisal Ibrahim that we should organize several Our Singapore Conversation discussions to explore some of these issues with fellow Singaporeans. I hope some members can join in such sessions. As public housing impacts the lives and well-being of many Singaporeans, we will need to deliberate over these issues carefully. I invite concerned Singaporeans of all ages to mull over these issues with us. Share with us your worries, your fears, your hopes, your dreams. We hope to hear many views and many ideas so as to better inform our housing policies. Let us work on the challenges together. Let us help shape our future housing policies together. Thank you.